Welcome back to The Contrarian, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Andy Sheckman for the third time now. He's the CEO of Miles Franklin, a world leader in the sales and consultation in gold and silver. Um, he's very outspoken when it comes to the historical backdrop for the gold and silver and precious metals space. Uh, Andy, thank you so much for coming on again. Good to be back, Logan. Thanks for having me, brother. Hope you're good. I am doing well. Um, so, Andy, maybe to get us started, I kind of want to get your thoughts on where the gold and silver markets are right now, basically halfway through 2024. I'm just finishing up July. I mean, at the beginning of the year, gold broke out, silver followed some. Um, gold's sitting close to all time highs. Silver's, you know, a little, maybe 40% from its all time highs. So, a lot of catching up to do. But where do you see these markets going in the coming months? And, and what, what do you think is the state of them right now? Well, I kind of feel, Logan, that, that the gold and silver markets are playing by a new set of rules. Um, kind of like the longstanding trend of price of gold and silver being determined by not only the Western institutional investors, but the Western banks, the commercial banks, the central banks, is breaking down. Um, I think the flow of gold from west to east is a real transfer of wealth. And I find it really crazy, if not um, worse, <laughs> how, on, how, how much the West is underestimating the significance of this. Um, we are seeing a massive accumulation by the world's central banks um, using the suppression of the Western paper markets to run cover indeed for their accumulation, which has reached levels that the world has never seen in, in over a hundred years in, in all central bank history, um, who are not just the wealthiest traders on the planet, but also the most well-informed traders on the planet. And I believe in particular in when we talk about gold, that gold is replacing the U.S. Treasury. Um, if we go back 25 years to 2000, we see that gold has doubled the performance of the 10-year Treasury. If we go back 50 years, we see gold has just surpassed the performance of the 10-year Treasury for 50 years. Uh, it's doubled over 10 years, but just scraped by its performance over the last 50. It has outpaced since 2000 every investment with the exception of Bitcoin, which started from zero. But if we look at even the S&P 500 over the last 24 years with dividends reinvested, it's averaged about 9.5% to gold's 9.9% compounding. Um, it was reclassified by the Bank of International Settlements as the world's only other tier one reserve asset next to U.S. Uh, treasuries and U.S. dollars. And when we see the, the world's biggest money, who is the most well-informed and influential group of traders on the planet, not only massively accumulating gold, but something even more interesting is the repatriation of gold. Over the past year and a half, two years, and many of which have done so over the last several months, we have seen a massive repatriation uh, agenda where these countries are bringing their gold back home. Look at the Bank of India as an example. India, who is either the number one or two largest uh, uh, accumulator of gold on the planet, well, they bought more gold in the first four months of this year than they did in all of last year, and they brought it all home. They repatriated it along with 100 metric tons that they've held at the Bank of England since 1991. The Bank of England and the New York Fed have been really the home for most of the world's gold over the last 50 years plus, because you had Western rule of law and a stable jurisdiction that gave direct access to the LBMA, a la the Bank of England, and to the COMEX, a la the uh, New York Federal Reserve. So they would keep their metal in these institutions with immediate access to the, to the large trading hubs. Interestingly enough, over the past 100 days, the cumulative volume in the Shanghai Gold and Futures Exchange has increased by 200% and outpacing the COMEX. It is now the, most, the second most um, uh, 
influential platform, I guess. It has the most volume, second most volume on the planet next to the LBMA, surpassing the COMEX. This flow from West to East is real, as is the repatriation. So in the past couple of years, much of which has been in the last several months, we've seen the Bank of Germany, Austria, Slovakia, Argentina, the Netherlands, Saudi Arabia just a few weeks ago, Hungary, Belgium, Egypt just a few weeks ago, Senegal, Romania, Nigeria just a few weeks ago, Poland, Ghana just a few weeks ago, India earlier this year, France, Turkey, Serbia, Venezuela, Algeria just a few weeks ago, Cameroon just a few weeks ago, South Africa just a few weeks ago, and Czechoslovakia. That's just a basic Google search. All of those countries, almost 30 of them, all brought their gold back home at the same time they've been buying it at a level the world has never seen. When we talk about silver, India has bought over almost 700 million ounces of silver in the last three years from the West and from recently the United Arab Emirates because of a treaty they have with them that allows import duties to be slashed. Of course, there's been such a black market in India, they have just took the unconventional step of reducing their import duties, duties across the board for gold or silver. But they bought more silver in the first four months of this year than they did all of last year, and one and a half times the amount of gold. You look at China, <clears throat> there's all sorts of reports out there now that China is going into South America where you know they have the Belt Road Initiative, which is the largest infrastructure project in human history, connecting Asia, Africa, South America, and parts of Europe with bridges and roads and railways and maritime channels. They are building like the biggest second biggest, most modernized uh, port in the world in Peru, which is the third largest producer of silver in the world behind Mexico, number one, and China, number two. Um, and they are striking deals. But throughout South America, they are buying up all of the unrefined silver at massive premiums to what the West would pay, which isn't doesn't affect the price of silver because it hasn't been refined yet. And, and they're going in and paying way above what anyone else would pay and bringing all of that unrefined silver home, unreported, uh, and at the same time, they refine it in, in China and they are able to do so without affecting the price. So we're seeing countries gobble up gold and gobble up silver. We see silver reclassified tier one. Uh, and there's a lot more that we need to talk about regarding gold, but just a basic uh, preliminary, I think, you know, what we're talking about is the most well-funded, well-informed traders in the world repositioning and looking at gold and silver as wealth. And I think we are entering a period of time that Zoltan Pozar called Bretton Woods Three. Zoltan used to work at the New York Fed. He understands the plumbing of the system maybe better than anybody. He now works, I think, at UBS, and he talks about this being Bretton Woods 3. For your listeners, uh, Bretton Woods 1 would have been when the dollar replaced the pound sterling at the end of World War II in Bretton Woods, uh, New Hampshire. Bretton Woods 2 would loosely be when we took over, um, well, well, after the, the gold window was closed by Nixon in 71, and then we backed our, our, our somehow backed into a relationship with the Saudis. Kissinger went there and struck a deal with the Saudi kingdom. We'll protect you. We'll provide you weapons. No one will ever mess with you, but for that, you'll you'll value oil globally in dollars and then take the excess reserves and put it into treasuries. Let's, let's look at the second half of that first. Saudi Arabia, China, India, Russia, Japan, they're all selling treasuries. China was at $3 trillion in treasuries nearly at one point. They're just over $700 billion now. Russia's out of treasuries. Saudi's been dumping treasury, treasuries. Even Japan has. And replacing it with gold, which has doubled its performance and has no counterparty risk. Counterparty risk in the respect that we have sanctioned all of these countries, but let's take it a step further. We have stolen $5 billion in assets, which is a default on the Treasury from Russia. Uh, the European Union has taken the interest of $280 billion in European Treasuries in the same respect, stolen them, and have in both cases provided them mostly in the in the form of weapons to the Ukraine, the country that they're fighting in a war. That is a line you don't come back from. It is not the prerogative of the West or of the world reserve currency to play judge and jury. Where we can say, where, where, where Janet Yellen can say to, to CNBC, if Xi Jinping 
and Putin want to be friends, we're okay with that. But if he gives one penny to the Russian war machine, that being Xi Jinping, we will sanction their banks, their companies in Beijing itself. Never mind that we have given at least $260 billion to the Ukraine with no congressional oversight, along with Stinger missiles and F-16 jets, with the intelligence on where to drop the bombs. That is a whole um, level of, of hypocrisy that the world is pushing back against. And I think that is part of the reason that we are seeing massive gold acquisition, replacing it in favor of the Treasury, as it has outperformed it. It has no counterparty risk, and it can't be sanctioned or stolen. <laughs> and so as Zoltan says, sorry, I'm dealing with some Florida allergies that I never had when I lived back in Minnesota. So oh, no worries. This time of year, it hits me hard. My eyes start to water. Anyways, the point of it is, is that he says this is now Bretton Woods 3. Bretton Woods 3, because remember, about three, four weeks ago, the Saudis at the anniversary of the sign and the 50-year signing of the Petro deal, they decided to not re-sign it. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the death for the dollar immediately. What it means is that they will not exclusively value oil in dollars. They'll take other currencies for it, too. For 50 years, every single country in the world, Logan has had to stockpile dollars in order to buy oil. And it's created a synthetic demand. The fact that they signed or didn't sign that deal, re-up it, saying, well, you know, it's our prerogative to sell it in whatever currency we want, is a massive deal. Maybe even a bigger deal that they are selling treasuries in favor of gold because of its outperformance and its lack of counterparty risk or, or, or counterparty liability. It's a bigger deal. And so when we talk about gold and silver, why have the prices not accentuated? That's what everyone wants to know. I mean, yeah, you know, th funny thing about it is that gold has outperformed every asset but Bitcoin since 2000. It's up 9.9% per year. It's doubled the 10-year treasury and it's beat the S&P 500 with dividends reinvested. It's the tortoise, not the hare, but it should still be a whole hell of a lot higher. Silver, on the other hand, should be massively higher. But without going too deep into it, I'll cite a couple of facts that will let you understand what's going on. And then we can dig deeper into where gold is going because I think there are some new facts that just came about that are huge and really important. But the, the LBMA, 140-year-old exchange, they tell us that they have either the lowest or the second lowest amount of silver they've ever had in the history of the exchange. It's being drained by the, the, the Eastern Central Banks who are standing for delivery. This is how they win. But the way that they've been able to control the price in London, and we'll talk about the COMEX as well, is that London says they have 800 million ounces of silver in their vaults, of which 500 million belong to the ETFs. Um, they're not for sale. That would leave 300 million available. Yet they tell us they trade 292 million ounces of silver per day. Now, here's the interesting thing. They admit that those numbers are 10 times understated because they only list or post the actual final settlement number, not the number of trades it took to get there. They say it's about 10 times understated, which would mean they're trading 2.9 billion ounces of silver per day. That's three and a half times annual global mine supply. And, you know, way more than they supposedly have uh, of only 300 million ounces, 10 times more per day than they have. That's rehypothecation. That is fractional reserve. That's Bernie Madoff scam. And it works until everyone stands for delivery, which we are seeing. They are using the suppression of the paper price, they being the Chinese and the Indians and the Saudis and the Russians, and by proxy through sovereign wealth funds and whatnot to stand for delivery. Um, and they're draining the exchanges. When we look at the COMEX, Oh, by the way, gold, it, they trade, they say they trade 20 million ounces per day, but at a 10 times um, factor, that's 200 million ounces a day that they're trading. Really? That, that No, no, that doesn't work that way. And on COMEX, the silver market right now is 1,500% rehypothecated, which means that if 16 people have a contract or 15 people have a contract, if they're lucky, one will get the silver, the rest would be cash settled if they all stood for delivery. It's a Ponzi scheme. And so by selling the same ounce of gold over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, knowing that 
maybe 1% of contracts have ever stood for delivery, that it's a way to hedge risk without standing for delivery. The sophisticated central banks and sovereign wealth funds in the East understand that's the Achilles heel. And so they've been standing for delivery where massive amounts of gold and silver are fleeing the Western vaults. Right now in Shanghai on the Shanghai Metals Exchange, which I just mentioned is now outpaced in terms of cumulative volume, the COMEX, silver is $4 an ounce higher than in the West. Why? Well, they're arbitraging. It was two, then two and a half, then three, then three and a half, now four. How high will it go? To arbitrage all of the metal that is not being, that has not been nailed down in the West, to the east for the traders who can buy in the west and deliver in the east that the big bullion banks the sophisticated traders are incentivized to accumulate in the west and deliver in the east but excuse me the bottom line is gold and silver are nowhere near where they will ultimately be and they are being accumulated by the biggest money in the world the most well funded and well informed money in the world using the brain dead suppression of the western markets which forever were used to create an illusion of dollar supremacy and bond market strength of the West is now being exposed as the Achilles heel. And the central banks of the East are slowly, not too fast, to cut off their nose to spite their face, but slowly accumulating and standing for delivery on the world's exchanges. So the price will, at some point, behave the way that most people in the United States think markets work instant gratification. And that's not even fast enough for most people because they've seen what NVIDIA and Apple and Bitcoin are capable of. And that's why no one notices the fact that gold has been the tortoise in the room that has won the race to every other form of assets with the exception of Bitcoin, which started from zero. Let's just keep that out of the equation for a moment. But all traditional assets, gold has performed better than over the last 25 years without anyone noticing it. And that is the exact type of environment that the central banks of the world are using to de-dollarize. Because why? Gold is what? The only other tier one reserve asset other than US dollars and treasuries, which has been that way for about 70 years. And when you realize that the Bank of International Settlements, Logan, is the bank that reclassified it that way, they're the most powerful bank on the planet. They're the puppeteer. You know, They're the, the puppet master. They're the ones that are pulling the strings. They're the central bank or central bank. They know where we're going. <clears throat> and the latest development coming out of the BRICS is something we should talk about after I shut up and answer any questions you have here as to why I think gold will go higher than anyone thinks possible. But what I do believe is this, that all commodities, not just precious metals, if the Chinese bought the London Metals Exchange a few years ago, that's the, the, the base metal platform. Um, copper, zinc, lead, steel. And they're now warehousing or building warehouses to warehouse the metal that's traded in London, in China, that they now own that exchange. They're striking deals all around the world in their Belt Road Initiative. 75% of human population, 50% of global GDP already, all throughout undeveloped parts of Africa and South America. As I mentioned, they're buying up all of the silver dore bars before refining. They're doing that with all forms of commodities, rare earths, 100% of all the rare earths were, were refined in, in China last year, 70 or 80%. That's 100%. 70 to 80% were produced in China and the Eurasian continent, mined. Um, they're striking deals all around the world, and in particular in undeveloped countries in a cooperative manner to industrialize, to build roads and bridges and maritime channels, train tracks, oil refineries, oil rigs, gold and silver mines, the highways to get it out to the airport that they build to send it into market and for that they get a piece of the pie in a cooperative fashion. But they realize that he or she who has the commodities wins. It used to always be he who has the gold makes the rules. I think that's part of the deal too, because that's where we're going. And I'll get to that in our next talk here in a moment, but our next topic. But he or she who has the commodities wins, in my opinion. And we are moving away from a world where it's about dead instruments, opaque dead instruments, into who has the commodities. And it's interesting that the countries in the BRICS nations, not only do they possess the majority of the commodities, they have the majority of the manufacturing capability. So as we have shed our manufacturing and accumulate most of our commodities from across the globe, these countries are 
the ones who have all of the commodities and all the manufacturing capability, along with the fact that they are selling dollars and treasuries, which has been the key to the dollar hegemony, and buying commodities with it, not just gold and silver, but wheat and corn and soybeans and base metals and precious metals and rare earths and and building the infrastructure and 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 this union of countries in the Belt Road, which is already you know, 150 plus countries, 10 countries already in, in the BRICS, another 59 have formally applied. This is becoming a union whereby the real price of gold and silver, just like the head of the Shanghai Gold Exchange said in 2015, he said, when the Chinese have the right to speak at the table, the real price of gold will be revealed. The BRICS just said, hey, we're going to do a grain exchange, and they're, they're now building a grain exchange. And, and the head of the grain exchange said, look, we produce more wheat than the West does, yet we have no control over its price because it's all controlled on COMEX. You see, they know what we're doing. They know that we control the price where we can push oil to negative 40 a barrel. They don't like that. They like the fact that, or want the fact that, and realize the fact that they produce more of the world's commodities than we do, and they consume more than we do, and they appreciate and understand them more than we do, and yet they have no control over price. That will change. And you see that already happening with Shanghai now being the number two biggest exchange on the planet. Just wait. Uh, you'll see the COMEX and the LBMA be exposed for what they are, a Ponzi scheme. We're not there yet. But that's why the price hasn't gone where people think it should be. Quite frankly, I think it's just beginning. Okay. And, you know, first probably three, four months of 2024, we were starting to see gold break higher, maybe break through the, the levels that were kind of, you know, key for it. Previously, it was kind of stuck around 2100. And now it's way higher than that. Um, I wonder if you think kind of the fundamental reason for these other countries in the East primarily wanting gold to be significantly higher, do you think it's because they are tired of basically the US exporting our inflation? to them primarily with um just being you know the dollar reserve currency and them having to buy treasuries and that's that's given the central bank the u.s uh, basically a great privilege in terms of being able to you know print way more money than otherwise we would be able to um do you think fundamentally the the reason for china russia india everyone else buying up you know gold selling off treasuries kind of ushering in this new maybe basket reserve currency. Do you think that it's a desire of them to improve the living standards and kind of have what what we have had for a while? Or what do you see? Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole premise of the Belt Road. We'll help industrialize you for a piece of the pie and we'll do it cooperatively. Uh, That's exactly. And they're finding safety in in numbers. And But it's a little deeper than that. Um, There was a meeting a few weeks ago in Novograd. Well, let's go back. At at the end of last year, in in August of last year, there was the BRICS meeting where the five countries were, uh, actually there were six, but Argentina turned it down because Millet took over. But the other five countries, Egypt, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, and um, United Arab Emirates were admitted to BRICS. And there was a meeting in Johannesburg in, in in a cooperative manner. The BRICS rotate their presidency each year. It was in Africa last year. It, it's in Russia this year. Um, I'm remiss to admit that I don't, I haven't figured out who's uh, next year. It wouldn't be hard to figure out. Just a simple Google search, but I'm not sure who gets it next year. But at the end of the meeting in August in Johannesburg, um, they came out and said, look, you know, we're going to table for a year the talk on the common currency, and we're going to task our finance ministers with going back to the drawing board and coming back to present their findings in the re- uh, the meeting in October uh, in, in Russia. And there's been two, there will be 200 meetings that started in January that culminate with the big meeting in October, all BRICS related, 200 meetings leading up to it. And there was a meeting a few weeks ago in Novograd that coincided with the G7 meeting in Italy. Um, The Royal Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia was invited to the meeting in Italy, and he turned it down. Busy, he said. Can't make it. Thanks for the invite. At the same time, 
he sent his finance ministers to the BRICS meeting in Novograd, where out of the BRICS meeting, we find 59 countries have formally expressed interest in joining. And a very, very big statement that came from uh, Delma Rousseff. Uh, Delma Rousseff is the former president of Brazil, and she is the head of the BRICS New Development Bank, number one, which is akin to the IMF in the West. Very big position. And she said that they, she had two meetings on the sidelines at the Novograd uh, summit where there was, I don't know, 20,000 people there representing 100 plus countries. So this is no small summit. And uh, she said, we have agreed in principle. I had a meeting, she said, with Sergey Glazyev, who I've talked about for three years. He's the reason I've been saying there will be a, a basket of commodities and a basket of currencies. He's the architect of the BRICS new currency idea. He's been talking about it for three years. And being that the BIS reclassified gold as the world's only other tier one reserve asset in 2019, and all the banks have been buying and bringing it home, bringing it home is the big part of where I'm going with this in a moment. Uh, I I mean, I've been saying this on, on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of YouTube videos since, since probably 2022. 2021, 2022, when he started talking about it. Well, she said, we had a meeting on the sidelines. Myself, that's Delma Rousseff, the head of the, the BRICS and Development Bank, Putin, and Sergei Glazyev, the architect of the BRICS uh, currency. And she said, we've agreed in principle to a new settlement unit, and it'll be called the unit, and it'll be trade over Project Embridge. Uh, Project Embridge is something I've been talking about for over a year. Um, started really talking about it at the end of 2023. Uh, but it's a cross-border payment service, uh, a cross-border payment platform developed by China, Hong Kong, Thailand, and the United Arab Emirates, and backed by the BIS. And it's important that we mention the backed by the BIS part. I'm going to have to go back and mention something that happened in 2017, 18, and 19 to set the context. But uh, the Project Embridge is um, a cross-border payment system that sidesteps SWIFT, doesn't have to transact anything. It, 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 it disintermediates the Western intermediary banks, so there's no SWIFT um, ability to sanction. And they did the first two test trades last year. I've been saying forever that gold and, and oil have been remonetized. I, I've said to you here today so far that gold is replacing the treasury, both in performance and counterparty risk, but so too is oil. You look at a, a $2 billion contract Iran just awarded to China to modernize their biggest airport. They're paying for it in oil. Gold and oil are being remonetized across the globe as assets that are worth more than the currency that purchases them. And it's no wonder that the first two trades that China did on Embridge uh, was using the digital yuan cross-border with the United Arab Emirates, who was one of the founders of it with China, um, in gold and in oil. And it worked. And it is now operational in its most basic form. They're, they have all sorts of plans for Embridge, but it is in its basic operational form right now. And that is the ability to trade central bank digital currencies from one country to the next without having to use the SWIFT system. And each country who sends the money, their central bank guarantees it, will provide whatever currency they need to switch back into. But all of this is done over, over a platform that is autonomous from the Western influence. So uh, this is a big deal. It becomes much bigger when we realize that Saudi Arabia just became a full participant on Project Embridge. I don't know how many countries, 50, 60, are observational partners right now. They're, they're watching, seeing how it goes. Saudi Arabia became a full member, a full participant in Embridge, the largest producer of oil in the world, who, is, who has joined the BRICS, the BRICS New Development Bank, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Belt Road Initiative, along with all the other OPEC countries on the Belt Road all of them on the Belt Road, the largest infrastructure project in human history, uh, who told folks in, uh, this year, just a few weeks ago, that, hey, we're going to take other currencies for oil, et cetera, et cetera, turned down an invitation to the G7 meeting and went to this meeting and has become a full participant in Enbridge. 
Delma Rousseff said, we have agreed in principle to a new currency for settlement called the unit, which will be 40% gold and 60% currencies of the BRICS plus nations. Now, when we realize, I want to read to you something here and put my glasses on. Uh, just a simple Google search came up with these countries who have repatriated, meaning bring their gold home over the past few years, many of which have been just in the past few months. As I mentioned, India bought one and a half times the amount of gold they bought all of last year and brought it home instead of leaving it at the Bank of England for, for quick trading. They also brought home 100 metric tons from the Bank of England that they've had since 1991 because they could then transfer it to the LBMA and boom, make a trade. Well, they don't want to do that now. They want to take possession of it. And here are the banks, the central banks, that have done so just recently. Germany, Austria, Slovakia, Argentina, the Netherlands, Saudi Arabia, which was just a few weeks ago, Hungary, Belgium, Egypt, just a few weeks ago, Senegal, just a few weeks ago, Romania, Nigeria, just a few weeks ago, Poland, Ghana, a few weeks ago, India, a few months ago, Turkey, France, Serbia, Venezuela, Algeria a few weeks ago, Cameroon a few weeks ago, South Africa a few weeks ago, and Czechoslovakia. That's just a smattering of all of them that have repatriated their gold and went on a gold buying spree. The central banks have bought more gold over the past two and a half years than at any time in the last hundred years. They're buying it hand over fist using the suppression of the Western paper markets like the LBMA, who can trade two 100 million ounces of gold per day. That's not even the COMEX. That's just the LBMA. And 3 billion ounces of silver per day. Three and a half times annual global mine supply. Are you kidding me? This is called Ponzi scheme. So they're using the distortion that is created through the suppression of the Western banks that is an attempt to make their currencies and their bond markets seem stronger than they really are because gold and silver, commodities in general, but in particular gold, is the canary in the mine shaft. It speaks to the dislocations. It speaks to the inflation. It speaks to the fiscal irresponsibility and the brain-dead monetary policy of, of the Western countries who have destroyed the value of their currency through the printing press. If you hold the price of gold and silver down, especially when you're maintaining low interest rates for all these years, uh, Gibson's paradox speaks of the inverse relationship between real interest rates and the price of gold. So if you step on interest rates, then you have to step on gold or it will expose the fallacy of it. Anyways, the bottom line is, is that these countries are all repatriating it. Well, let's talk about the unit for a moment. I read the white paper on the unit token. And the unit token is will be the common settlement currency. At least that's what they've agreed upon in principle. They've agreed to have a meeting in September in China to ratify this unit and Embridge delivery system. And then perhaps roll it out uh, in October in their big meeting, along with whichever countries have of the 59 that said they want to join, which of those countries have been admitted. So the white paper says a couple of very interesting things. Uh, it says that the basket or the, the currency, the unit, will be 60% currency of the BRICS plus nations and 40% gold in kilo bar form deliverable upon request. Uh, and it says that the gold and the currency will be held in an escrow account and audited independently, continuously, to maintain the, uh, the, the viability and the pureness of the, and the authenticity of the unit token. Um, but it will be held within the borders of the countries that possess the metal and the currency. So all of these countries repatriating their gold from what used to be the epicenter of, of trust, the LBMA and the COMEX, which is now being exposed as a Ponzi scheme, and they're draining these exchanges using that suppression against us, where no one ever stood for delivery. 1% or less of these contracts stood for delivery. Now you're seeing massive outflows of gold and silver to these Eastern countries who are using the ability to stand for delivery against us, largely through sovereign wealth funds um, that have, you know, that are not as transparent, and largely through the LBMA, which the London Bullion Metal Association, which is an over-the-counter platform. It is not a um, exchange platform like the COMEX, where there's much more accountability, much more transparency. An over-the-counter deal is me versus you, we trade with one another, and our what, however we decide to settle is up to us. I could I could settle with gold American eagles if you wanted, 
on the LBMA. I mean, they give you the ability to, it's much more opaque. Uh, there's far less regulation and it's a way for these big countries to drain the exchanges. The LBMA says we have the, the lowest amount of silver we've ever had. So when you take a look and realize that the gold is held within the country that is going to mint this new unit token, which will be traded over Project Enbridge, which is not compatible with U.S. dollars, which Saudi Arabia just became a full participant in, which would eliminate the need to stockpile dollars because what it talks about is that each one of these countries, remember, Project Enbridge is for central bank digital currencies, to trade their central bank digital currencies. And it will allow these countries to have their own monetary autonomy, not be reliant upon the U.S. dollar, having to first convert into a U.S. dollar and then into to buy a commodity. Uh, there's so much conversion in and out of dollars to go back and forth between currencies and KYC and AML, know your client, anti-money laundering, that these banks, it becomes very costly, very time consuming, and it's a benefit to the West. Everyone has to stockpile dollars, creates a demand for dollars to settle commodity trades. Well, now each one of these countries will have their own ecosystem, their own central bank digital currency. 98% of the world's GDP, the countries that comprise it, 98% are all building CBDCs, including the United States, who the number two in charge at the White House, Lael Brainerd, a modern monetary theorist, developed the CBDC while she was at the New York Fed, or the Boston Fed, rather. Um, and just ran point for Fed now, which is Venmo and Zelle on steroids backed by the Fed, instant settlement. She's a modern monetary theorist. This is what she wants. So all of these countries are going CBDC. So Project Enbridge says you can trade your CBDCs over this platform without the ability of the West to intervene, to sanction. And we are going to use gold, which will be deliverable as the 40% peg along with 60% of the BRICS countries' currency. Well, I did an interview with Vince Lancey, a smart guy who was a commodity trader. He says, yeah, these countries will probably back their currency by gold too, like Russia, like China. They're accumulating way more than they're telling us. Even the IMF admits to that, just came out with a report saying China's buying way more and producing way more than they're letting us on to believe. Alistair McLeod will tell you they have 40,000 metric tons. That'd be five times what the United States has. They tell us they only have 2,600 metric tons. It's a lie. They produce four to 500 themselves a year as the largest producers in the world. They're banks that buy as a proxy for the P PBOC, the People's Bank of China. They don't have to report to the IMF, nor if they buy gold that's under 995 pure, do they have to report to the IMF. They're buying all the silver Dore bars that you're not refined. They're not reporting that. And that doesn't affect the price because it hasn't been refined yet. They bought the London Metals Exchange. They're buying everything in the Belt Road all around the world. They're buying all these commodities. But as far as gold is concerned, it will be the peg to a new system, deliverable, but held within the own borders of the countries, not sent to Beijing, not sent to Moscow. Each country will possess it and have it independently audited. And big penalties for not adhering to the purity of the unit ecosystem. So continuously audited independently. But when you realize all these countries are pulling back their gold from the Bank of England and the New York Fed, this is why, in my opinion. And the BIS has a history of doing things this way. When the BIS reclassified gold as the only other tier one asset in 2019, if you go back two years before, you see out of nowhere, after gold had been falling for six straight years, the Bundesbank of, Japan, of Germany, Austria, Hungary, Turkey, Poland, the Czech National Bank, the Dutch National Bank, all these banks brought all their gold back from the Bank of England and the New York Fed within weeks of the Bundesbank happening. In 2018, those same banks bought more gold as a group than they did in the 60 years previously combined in 2019. That number was doubled, and then miraculously, the BIS reclassified gold tier one. Well, the BIS is behind Enbridge. So look at all these countries that are buying gold hand over fist. Where I said India bought one and a half times the amount they bought last year, which is a record year, just in the first four months and brought it home, along with 100 metric tons at the New York Fed, all, or excuse me, at the Bank of England. All of these countries. Central banks bought more gold in the last two and a half years than any time in the last hundred years, more so than ever in central bank history, and they're all repatriating it. Do you think that 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 the BIS, who's behind Enbridge, has anything to do with that? That's how they did it in 2017 and 18, and then miraculously in 2019, when those numbers were way up, 
oh yeah, gold's tier one. Well, now I think they've told everyone, here's what we're going to do. There's going to be a common settlement currency. It's going to be pegged to gold. And if you know what's good for you, you will bring all your gold home. The 30 countries I just read to you, there's a lot more than that. That's just a simple Google search. And you'll buy the hell out of it. And you can use the brain-dead monetary policy and fiscal policy, your responsibility of the West and their desire to, to, to hold back the price of gold to run cover for your acquisition of it. So I think it goes higher than anyone thinks possible, Logan. And I think that the people who are the most well-informed traders on the globe, the commercial banks, they are the central banks, they know this. And that's why they're buying it. And that's why they're repatriating it. And the BIS behind it, that's how they do things. They clue in their buddies. And then a couple of years after the fact, when they've accumulated it all and brought it all home, oh, well, here it is. Well, now we have this meeting in September to ratify Embridge and the unit. They've agreed upon it in principle. Does that mean they'll roll it out in October? Don't know. But if they do, it is the beginning of the end of the as, of the dollar as the world reserve currency. Uh, I would... I would argue just by Saudi Arabia not re-upping the exclusivity of it in June, that the hegemony is gone. The supremacy isn't. But you, in, in essence, kneecap the need to hold dollars and treasuries with one fail swoop. All of these countries will have no need to hold either. In fact, they would be incentivized to dump dollars and treasuries and buy commodities, in particular gold. So... Yeah, I think we're going to a place that people will have a hard time imagining. Yeah, and I know until then, it's kind of hard to predict the exact path per se. Like, does gold continue marching higher and then all of a sudden goes, you know, way higher? Or um, I guess I also try to think of it in terms of real purchasing power. Like, does the dollar all of a sudden undergo some sort of overnight, you know, devaluation as well? So you could argue the dollar that, is devaluing right now, even though, I mean, the inflation numbers that we are, are being told are a lie. Uh, and yeah, I do think that's exactly how it will go. I think, I mean, gold has been creeping higher. It's averaged 9.9% per year since 2000. It's, it's outpaced everything. Um, and then it will go way higher when the realization that this is the system that we are moving towards becomes acute. People in the West have no idea what's coming. They can't get out of the way of what they don't see coming because our media doesn't yeah. do a crappy job. They do no job of telling us what's really <laughs> happening. So, yeah, I call it logarithmic decay. Little by little by little by little then all at once. And and that's what it is. And you can see the little by little is are the central banks. They know the playbook. So quietly, let's use the Western suppression to de-dollarize and wickedly accumulate gold and bring it home without really distorting the price. Mm. And then when it becomes obvious to the rest of the world that this is what's happening, the big money, as usually happens, is already sitting comfortably in their position, um, and then they'll let it run. So, yeah, I do think that's what will happen. And it's interesting, <clears throat> gold is held in... Most central bank balance, all central bank balance sheets across the globe, Logan, in a, an account called the gold revaluation account. You can't make it up. Over my shoulder there, that's what Roosevelt did in 1933 when he confiscated gold. He valued the dollar by 40%, in essence, revaluing gold by 40%. The head of the Dutch National Bank has been very adamant about this. He says, we hold gold to... Um, restart the system when all hell breaks loose. Uh, he says, we hold gold, even though our balance sheet is upside down right now, we don't, I'm not concerned because we have 20 billion euro in the gold revaluation account. Well, okay. on central bank balance sheets, you're not allowed at this point to offset liabilities with your gold. So gold is in your asset side of the, of the balance sheet and, you know, balance after balance out the same amount in the gold revaluation account is on the liability side. So, and it's valued at 35 bucks an ounce in all of those central banks. That's the Bretton Woods number. And if you think about it, how high could gold go, being that it will be backing a new system? Even look at the way the West talks about it, right? Kristalina Georgieva, the head of the IMF, said any CBDC not pegged to something is fiat. 
But before that, the IMF, her, her institution, made uh, issued a report. You can Google it, pop right up. Um, gold as a bar or as an international reserve currency, comma a barbarous relic, no more question mark. It is the only other tier one asset. I think they all know that a, a CBDC has to be pegged to something. That a system that has lost so much trust uh, through inflation, through weaponization will need to be trustless. There will have to be something that inspires trust. That is the marriage of blockchain technology, a la uh, the uh, Project Ambridge and the unit and and a commodity like gold. And, and that's exactly what will happen. I, I really do believe that. And they could revalue it just like that. Heck, in China right now, silver is four bucks an ounce higher. Why? That's the real price of silver right now because that's what someone will pay for it. So they're inspiring and incentivizing the traders in the West who have access to the COMEX, the LBMA, and the Shanghai Exchange to buy in the West and deliver in the East. What if they made it $9, $12, $50 higher, $100 higher? What is the real price? What if they say gold is 10000 an ounce? This is what we'll pay for it. This is the market price. That is the market price, not the BS that the that the Western markets have created this illusionary price through the ability to trade years worth of mining production in one day, way more than they have bars backing the contracts. That's what the Hunt brothers noticed in 1980. They bought, they yeah. said there's way more contracts than there are bars. So let's buy all the contracts and stand for delivery. And they did. And they drove the price up. And then the exchange changed the rules on them and said, well, you can be long only a certain amount, but you can be short as much as you want. So all those contracts they had had to be sold or they were in violation of law, go to jail. So they changed the rules against them. But it's the same environment right now. The only difference is all the countries in the East realize it and are standing for delivery quietly. They are standing for delivery, draining the exchanges. And I think gold will be revalued. It will be revalued to back a new system. Who knows how high? James Rickard says 27,000. Math he uses. Jim Sinclair used to say 10,000. But at 10,000, now you offset it against your liabilities. Your, your balance sheet goes from horrendous to pristine, just like that. And, and now you peg it to a new system that will never come back down. Do I think that'll happen? Yeah, I do. There's no other reason the BIS, which is the most powerful bank in the world, they're the pup puppet master. They're the ones pulling the strings. They're the central banker, central bank, the most powerful bank on the planet. Why would they reclassify gold, the only other tier one asset? Why would all of these banks be repatriating their gold, bringing it home, and buying it at a level the world has never seen? Um, because it's part of what's coming next. And I think that that's the part that people in this country have a hard time with, both instant gratification not being fast enough and having to validate things with their own eyes. And our media is not allowing people to get out of the way of what's coming. They don't see it. And you can't get out of the way of what you don't see coming because they don't talk about what's relevant. I spend three, four hours a day, seven days a week digging on websites across the globe to find this information that you don't find on Reuters or CNBC or Fox News. You got to dig. And uh, I will tell you that gold is, is being remonetized around the world. It is being accumulated by the most influential traders on the globe. And if indeed they do ratify the unit settlement currency, which will be backed 40% by gold, that eviscerates the need for dollars and treasuries. And this is why maybe you're slowly seeing the divestiture of treasuries by these banks. They know the playbook. So they accumulate gold, they repatriate it. They're very private about how much they're accumulating and producing. They don't update the numbers. They are lying about how much they produce. Even the IMF and the lead analyst at the Bank of Montreal says it publicly. They're definitely way, way understating what they own, but that's across the board. Why would they want to? We don't. Ron Paul has asked to have Fort Knox audited twice and was turned down both times. It's our gold, he says. It's the people's gold. Why won't you audit it? Since 1953, rather, it hasn't been audited. Why? Is it not there? Many people think we've leased it out to control the price. If it is there, why not audit it? Why did it take five, six years to send Germany's gold back? And in 2017, they made a big stink about it, but had been trying to do it since 2012. So the question is, or the point is, it's in no country's vested interest to tell anyone how much gold they have, especially if they know we're coming to a point where it will be the cornerstone of a new system. Okay, we were lying about how much gold we have and produce. Here it is. Come audit it. Because if everyone knew that all the big money was trying to get gold because of its importance and it's going to be revalued, everyone would run to get it. So they're crowding. They effectively would be crowded out of their own desire. 
So they misdirect. The book, The Art of War, talks about misdirection. It's 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 mandatory reading at CIA in West Point. It's taught in most business schools on corporate hierarchy. It's taught on most law schools on formulating arguments. Even Bill Belichick, maybe the best football coach ever, read it all the time to formulate game theory. It's a book about misdirection, which is very pervasive. And if you think that these these countries are being forthright and honest about something as as big as a once in a generation Rubicon crossing over, rather, they're not. And so the bottom line is, yeah, I think uh, gold will go higher than anyone thinks possible. It will be pegged to a new system, maybe even in the West, as as a way to either challenge or um, or to to meet tit for tat the BRICS issuing a gold backed settlement currency. I believe the IMF would would want to do the same thing. So I guess we'll see. But uh, yeah, I think gold and silver are are not investments. I mean, silver might be the best investment on the planet, but I don't hold it for that reason. I hold it because it's wealth, Logan, that's outlived two world wars, German hyperinflation, the Great Depression, every pandemic. And here we are 5,000 years after it was mentioned in the Bible, I don't know how many hundreds of times, that the most well-funded, well-informed, influential, well-informed, highlight, traders on the planet are buying at a level the world has never, ever seen and repatriating it all. And if the unit token is correct, the white paper, if they do ratify that, which it looks like they will, they said we've agreed in principle, Delma Rousseff, the head of the of the uh, BRICS New Development Bank, the former president of Brazil, along with Putin and Glazyev, the architect of all this, if indeed it's true, gold will go higher than anyone thinks possible. Um, so yeah, I think it's never been more important to own gold and silver, not as an investment, but as wealth, that the biggest money in the world uh, is showing every desire, if you look closely enough, to to stockpile and possess free of counterparty risk. Thank you. And it sounds like at least buying gold and silver directly, you really would say um, go with the physical metal and not the ETF just to make sure that you have physical delivery of it. I'm curious also to hear your perspective on the mining stocks, because these have definitely been some of the underperformers in the last few years. I mean, just looking at where the mining stocks are valued comparatively to where the price of gold and silver is, one would think there would be a catch-up rally at some point or, you know, something would have to adjust there. But what do you see, you know, with regards to the mining stocks? I know if if something abruptly changed, you could also see a push to, you know, maybe nationalize some of these companies, just the national importance that would suddenly be there. Um, but yeah, yeah, curious to hear your thoughts For on the sure. mining. I mean, I, I, I'm, I love mining shares. I own some. I think I follow the Swiss model, um, which is a pyramid, the shape of a pyramid where uh, 60, 70 percent of your assets are found in the base of your pyramid would be things like physical precious metals, even though it's being eroded cash paid for home, real estate, paid for farm, whatever, stable, low growth, low yield, um, you know, earning a few percent now, even though gold's gone up by 9.9% per year, it's in the base of the pyramid, physically owned in your possession, paid for real estate. The middle portion of your pyramid, 20 or 30%, it could, you could say utility stock throwing off a 4 or 5% dividend or short-term treasury, six months or less, 5.5%. Uh, which seems to be changing as the curve is uninverted, uh, uninverting right now. And that's an ominous sign in and of itself. Since 1950, every uninversion after an inverted yield curve has, has, was the, um, it, it preceded a, a massive, um, uh, recession. So we appears to head, we are appear to be heading into a recession based upon the yield curve starting to uninvert, but the middle portion of your pyramid, 20, 30% short-term treasuries, six months or less, 5%. Uh, and then the top 10% would be your cryptocurrencies and your mining shares. The theory is you lose everything on the 10%. You make nothing on the middle 20 or 30. As long as you don't risk the base to speculation, you're not moving backwards. In a perfect world, you kill it on the top 10%. You make your 5% in the middle and, and the bottom's gravy. But what it is, it's not inverting like Exeter's pyramid. It's it's not inverting risk. You put the stable, safe, low yielding 
uh, assets in the base year pyramid. And I highlight the word assets, even though I said cash could fit in there, even though it's inflating. Uh, wealthy people own lots of assets. They don't have massive bank accounts. They might, but their real wealth is in assets. And so you put your paid for assets in the base of your pyramid, something a little bit more speculative in the middle that throws off some interest and the home run on the top 10%. And I think mining shares possess that type of leverage. Um, they're wholly underappreciated. They have started to break out a little bit. Uh, I think everyone should own some, but don't, you know, they're cousins at best, right? Second cousins, uh, because gold and silver are assets that are not simultaneously someone else's liability. And if you or any of your listeners have taken the time to watch on YouTube or read The Great Taking by David Rogers Webb, that'll scare the crap out of you and will make you think twice about holding any securities. But, and I think everyone should read it. It's really, really important. Or we'll go to YouTube and watch it. It's about an hour long video narrated by David Rogers Webb, the author. Um, it's um, it's a situation where, yeah, I think people should own mining shares, but it is not a substitute for gold. It is uh, an undervalued asset class that has tremendous potential that is related to gold, but doesn't have the profile, the riskless profile uh, that physical metals do. But that top 10%, can outperform the bottom 90% if it takes off. And that's kind of the idea behind it. So it's uh, pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered type of mentality. Don't be too greedy in an environment like this where everything can go pear-shaped. So yeah, I like them. I think they should be owned, but up in the top 10% of the financial pyramid. Yeah, thank you for helping us You know, keep that in perspective and just hear your opinion where the mining shares are right now. And maybe I'd like to give you the last few minutes just to let my viewers know any kind of final thoughts you have on where we are historically and, and just what to keep in mind and also where they can find you to get in contact with you or hear more of your thoughts. Well, the best way to get in touch with us, even though we have a website, a new one coming out in about four weeks or less, uh, which would be version three, which will be much more user friendly. Uh, the best place to get in touch with us to get our price list that we don't publish that will be as good or better than anywhere in North America, much better than the prices we have online. Info at milesfranklin.com. Info at milesfranklin.com. Questions on any anything we've talked about today? Uh, my eyes stop watering. I'm so sorry. Um, and um, Or anything that, that's on your mind related to economics or precious metals. Info at Miles Franklin. Precious metals IRAs. Price list. Nothing else. You want to be contacted, put your phone number down, and we'll do that. Uh, as far as where we are, look, um, it took 200 years to create a trillion in debt. We're doing it every 100 days. That's $100,000 in debt every second. One, two, three, four, five. So you keep going. That's how much debt we're creating every second. Um, a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. And we're creating a trillion in debt every 100 days. We have a $35 trillion debt. We just crossed over to $35 trillion that everyone knows about. But that doesn't take into account Medicare Part B, $99 trillion underfunded. Medicare Part D, the prescription, $22 trillion underfunded. Social Security, $77 trillion. Government, military pensions, another off-balance entitlement. I mean, we're, we're at $200 trillion in debt. And... The, the fiscal irresponsibility of this country that continues to spend money like it's going out of style, where we are a country, you know, we haven't even talked about what's happened inside this country. If it were just the mismanagement of the dollar, where our lead economic advisor, Jared Bernstein, advocates for losing the world reserve currency, a privilege we can no longer afford. I, mean, I think we've done a pretty good job of that by signing executive order to go green and then weaponizing the dollar and, in fact, stealing Russian assets. Five billion in Russian treasuries that we stole. That's default. And worse yet, we've provided it to the military industrial complex in the form of five billion in payments to build weapons to send to the Ukraine, uh, the country that they're in a war against. Not a good thing. Um, so it's bad enough what we've done around the globe, but we're a country that's let 20 million people or more in this country illegally. If 5% have ill intention, that's a million people. That's bigger than a standing army. One-tenth of 1% is 20,000. Um, 
we have lawlessness in our cities. Um, we have a country that doesn't respect authority anymore. And you can always challenge authority when I was a kid, but politely you said, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You held the door for a lady. You were, you were, um, defined by your merit, how hard you worked. Everyone had the same opportunity, equal opportunity, um, not equality, but equal opportunity. You listen to Kamala Harris, she keeps talking about equality, equality, equality. No, it's equal opportunity. It doesn't matter what color, what creed, what race. My company started from nothing, from zero. My dad's middle name is Miles. His best friend, Franklin, lent us $60,000 in 1989 before the internet to start a company in a one-room office the size of a closet, least likely cast of characters to have eclipsed 10 billion in sales 34 years later. I had an opportunity and I maximized it. And I had no, no more or no less of a chance to do that than anybody. In fact, you could argue probably the least likely person to have ever done it. Didn't even graduate college. And here I am talking to the world about economics 34 years later. It's because of opportunity and hard work. Um, and I thank God every day I was born in this country, but we've gone so far astray. People question our electoral system. Is it fair? Is it not? They question our judicial system. Is it two-tiered? Is it fair? Is it not? Are they weaponizing it? Uh, they, they question our immigration system. Are we doing it to create a serfdom of loyal voters who will never vote Republican? Is that what why they want to give them voting rights? Your listeners should Google the the, the um, theory called Cloward Piven. Cloward, C L O W A R D Piven, P I V E N theory. That 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 references a husband and wife set of professors who who taught a class at uh, Columbia University in the '60s. Ironically. Obama and Jared Bernstein, the lead economic advisor, went to, to Columbia, where, along with Madeleine Albright, Bill Barr, Eric Holder, uh, the current um, uh, chief of staff, uh, Bilkin, they all went there. And the whole theory is to overwhelm the, the inner cities and the welfare system and, 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 and create universal basic income and create a serfdom of people who will only vote your way. Well, think of all the people we've led in this country and they want to give them voting rights. And they're Right now, 65% of all taxpayer-based subsidies are, are for people in this country illegally. Read the Clower Piven theory will make the hair on your arm stand up. It's what they're doing. But so elections, wokeness, lifestyle versus uh, merit, uh, open borders, uh, lawless, and all this stuff on top of the mismanagement. It's never been more important to be a contrarian, Logan, and it's never been more important to pay yourself first, uh, to get out of debt best you can, especially variable rate debt, to continually pay yourself first, save. If 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 you can do it in gold and silver, wonderful. Any way you can do it, save and, and, and start um, getting out of the system best you can, because when this breaks, uh, it'll be something that catches people way off guard. Because when it breaks, when the dollar is no longer desired, and if it happens all at once and everyone dumps dollars, at some point, you will see rates go higher and higher and higher and higher and maybe spike as the inflation really starts to hit through massive dollar dumping because everyone in the world's had to stockpile dollars to buy oil. And that's changing. And if they no longer need to do that, the demand for the dollar falls, meaning the supply increases, meaning inflation and the byproduct of that type of wicked inflation would be interest rates that have to rise to compensate. What would 30% interest rates look like in this economy right now? I mean, hopefully it doesn't go there. How about 20%? It's disastrous. Yeah. Right. And, and that's right. And so if you have 25 or 30% inflation, what's well, already at 11 or 12%, they're not being honest about inflation. Go to shadowstats.com, John Williams. He'll show you that just measuring it the way it was in the 80s, we're at like 12% inflation, not the three that they're telling us. So what if it went to 20% and rates had to compensate? Stocks, bonds, real estate, the over-leveraged, undercapitalized banks, and the insurance companies loaded with 90% treasuries, they all blow up. And there's your great reset. And there's Leo Brainerd, the modern monetary theorist who developed the CBDC with MIT when Biden fast-tracked it by executive order, who ran point for Fed now, the number two economic advisor of the U.S. government, where if, if Kamala wins, she'll be the head of the Federal Reserve next. She was number two under Powell before she transitioned to uh, economic advisor. She wants that. She wants a, a new central bank digital currency to start over. And 
it would be they did it to us, those bastards, Xi Jinping and Putin and OPEC and the BRICS. How could they do it to us? You have a rallying cry. So people talk about inflate or defaults. I'll give you two other options. One, find a villain. That's Putin, Xi Jinping, and OPEC. Or two, revalue the price of gold way higher. And all the gold that you have that is not currently uh, able to be written off against your balance sheet, you change those rules. Just like Roosevelt did in the, in 1933. And you put gold at 10000 an ounce in your balance sheet. Just like that is perfect gold. Never comes back down. And the IMF, along with the BRICS, they all peg gold to a new system. Do I think it will happen? I do. Why else would the most powerful, influential bank on the planet reclassify gold, of all things, as the only other tier one asset? Why? Why are they all buying it and repatriating it? Why? Why is you know the BIS backing Project Enbridge and the and the unit token saying it's 40% gold? Why does the IMF say a CBDC not pegged to something is fiat? Why did they issue a report saying gold a barbarous relic? or an international reserve currency, a barbarous relic, no more, question mark. Gold will be part of what's coming. So yeah, if you have the ability to pay yourself first every every two weeks or something when you get paid in silver or gold, do it. That was the only rule I made to my dad and uh, that I agreed to. My father and I started this company in 1989. He said, you'll buy something every two weeks. And I have. I've honored my promise for thirty almost 35 years. And I've never missed a two-week period. It's the best gift he ever gave me. Pay myself first and learn the laws of compounding, how it can work in your favor instead of against you. It doesn't always have to be compounding of interest. It can be compounding of time. Uh, just like when you work out or you diet or you strengthen a relationship, it takes effort, continual, methodical, habitual effort. Same thing about paying yourself first. So what would I do? I'd pay myself first. I would become a contrarian uh, because if you hold everything in dollars, you're destined to go broke at some point, and uh, even whether it be slowly or all at once. And uh, if you're not a contrarian, I think you're destined to be a victim. Um, so again, gold and silver to me are not an investment, Logan. They're wealth, and the biggest money in the world is showing you that. So that's all I got for you, brother. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. I hope I'm wrong. I got three kids, man. My youngest is 17. I do. I really hope I'm wrong. I don't think I am. I think that this is just the very beginning of a shift away from promises made by a broken, insolvent country that much of the world over half of its population feels, probably more like three quarters of its population, feels as hypocritical. And uh, I think we're at the foothills of, of a change, crossing over that once in a generation Rubicon, where it's time to, to, to be contrarian. And unconventional times call for unconventional thought. So that's where I am, and uh, I would love to pick back up with you down the road and see how right I am and or how wrong. And uh, as we head into the big BRICS meeting in October and the biggest election of our lives, uh, I don't think it's smooth sailing. I've been saying that long before Trump was shot. Um, will this will 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 it be smooth sailing? Probably not. So buckle up, yeah. pay yourself first, be a contrarian, and and hopefully you and I can pick up where we left off and chat some more. Uh, maybe right before the election or right after up to you. Yeah, I hope to do that as well. Andy, thanks so much for coming on. Pleasure is mine, my man. I wish you and everyone else out there a great rest of your day. And uh, as the Chinese curse says, may we live in interesting times. <laughs>